the Zoom bar. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here for the Fusion Party's monthly members meeting for the month of March 2023. My name's Andrea Leong and I am the Secretary of Fusion. Um, I am signed in from Gadigal land, uh, part of Eora country, um, and I pay my respects to Gadigal elders past and present. Tonight we will be uh, having a bit of a focus on our Aston candidate. We've got a by-election for the seat of Aston coming up um, in just one month. Um, so a quick, quick timeline, a short, sharp campaign. And that by-election has been triggered by the resignation of Alan Tudge, formerly the Social Service Minister, uh, currently embroiled in the robo-debt uh, scandal, which has been a uh, very brutal process on a lot of people's lives. Um, so we will come to Owen's um, introduction uh, very soon. Also on the agenda tonight, we'll have our regular updates and a bit of a wrap up on our Mardi Gras Fair Day stall. And then after we hear from Owen, we'll hear from our president, Saha, about Fusion's values, which uh, we've uh, come to understand in a series of workshops and um, we're now articulating them to the public. So just a very quick, just one slide for the membership. And I've forgotten to change the heading on there. That should be at the uh, 1st of March or the 28th of February. Um, so our total membership numbers are 1,793 members, up three since last month. So very little change. We've had 10 or 12 people join and uh, resignations or expired memberships from three fewer than joined up. And uh, no, no great changes. They haven't been in any one state or territory really. Um, so that's that's all there is for membership. Nothing exciting there. And I'll hand over to our treasurer, Michael Morosky, for our monthly finance update. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as usual, try to be quick. Um, so uh, profit loss for the February, uh, month of February, we, um, it's as sort of the last couple, it's been a sort of um, not a hugely eventful uh, period. Um, Donations uh, somewhat steady, but sort of slightly low, a little bit lower than usual. Uh, Two hundred and fifty-one dollars in the, the sort of the normal donations. Um, the uh, operating expenses in this case a little higher than uh, the, the 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 income. So uh, we came out sort of in the negative this uh, this month, but that's generally a that's not a bad thing. Um, so there's some standard uh, costs there, IT services, that's uh, that in particular is our Google, monthly Google accounts for all of our admin stuff. Um, and we have another sort of large item there of merchandise. So that was a number of things that were purchased for the Mardi Gras store, um, which will be talked about later. So, and then transaction fees is just some things from, from later. Now there's a couple of things that were actually, um, uh, most we paid this month that just seem some some other things have have um have made them carry over to the next month so uh there's a usually with the those sort of the some of the operate general operating expenses would be a bit higher than that uh but they'll some of those will be just included in the next month so that'll be a little bit higher than usual um so yeah so um sort of negative 373 dollars and 78 cents for that month so it's not a sort of a massive change or massive drop um but when we're spending money on things that uh can promote the brand and promote the party. Um, that's generally considered worth it. Um, so just on the next slide, just looking at our balance sheet. Um, so these are the so across across the various um, accounts. We have nine thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars. There's just a few sort of liabilities or just uh, reimbursements that need to be paid at the moment. So uh, currently in the, the the main number in the coffers has been the bottom there of. Nine thousand four hundred twenty-nine dollars and thirty-nine cents. So that's uh, that's the position we're at at the moment. So obviously, over the next little while, um, with the Aston election, uh, that's very much cause for us to be uh, doing all sorts of financial activity. Uh, the the party is yet to determine uh, exactly what the the sort of the financial strategy will be, or how much will be able to be allocated directly to the, the campaign. Uh, this is to be sort of sorted out mostly tomorrow. So. Um, 
will be trying to sort of assist with that. Like, hopefully we can assist there as much as possible. There'll be donation pages coming up and uh, we'll encourage everyone to really jump in and support that. But that'll be, that'll be talked about more afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and that would be it from me. Cool. Thanks very much, Michael. Any questions for our treasurer? If not, then yeah, we'll move on just to a quick um, quick report on our Mardi Gras Fair Day stall. This was on Sunday 19th and it was one of the first events in um, the Sydney Mardi Gras Festival and also it's big this year uh, because it's part of World Pride. So we had the, um, the Mardi Gras parade on the Saturday just gone and there's still another ongoing week of events right now. Um, so we had six volunteers throughout the day across six hours from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Victoria Park uh, in inner Sydney. Um, and it was the first time we've done this. So we've learned some valuable lessons. Um, we had some of these wonderful hand fans here. That was um, that was Owen's idea. Um, you can't maybe read it there. It says renewable energy. I'm a big fan. They were great conversation starters and we had our QR code on there and encouraged people to scan that to, um, to go to our link tree and to sign up to our newsletter. Um, it was very, very hot, so they were quite popular. Yeah, everyone was uh, looking for something to keep cool on the day. One of the suggestions we've had since is to get um, an actual, like a big, a big fan in our stall and that would be nice for the volunteers on a hot day. It was uh, it was pretty sticky. Um, we also had this uh, nice pull-up banner here, and I'm hoping it's possible to get this refitted to something different to use for other events. Um, if not, I think I think we'll manage to do it ourselves with a sticker. Um, so this was a take on RuPaul's Drag Race, and the idea was that people would um, drag the worst policies that they were con you know, concerned about um, with the government, but the crowd was actually not so political. We were in a, a strip of uh, five or six political stalls, as well as queer Sydney Irish. For some reason, they got lumped in with the political stalls. Um, but the crowd, I think, was there to um, find out, you know, more about the communities um, and not so much get uh, get into a, a deep political conversation. We did have a few people um, who were highly politically engaged and uh, we're happy to have a photo taken in front of our parliamentary reading room banner. Um, and we had some other other things up at the stall as well, like these lovely neon lights and uh, some of our um, most... Uh, our policies that we'd hoped were most relevant to the LGBTQ community. Also, I love the banner in the background, safety in the streets, freedom in the sheets, which is, um, I mean, that, that really sums it up that everybody should be safe when they're out and about and then come home to who they love without uh, judgment and without different treatment under the law. Um, yeah, so... My feeling was that it was neither under-organised nor over-organised. I think it's possible to over-organise an event. Um, but it was started, the planning was started in October where um, we weren't sure of the um, the relationships between different committees. So I should have spoken more with Sahar as engagement chair to get some more ideas around what we actually wanted to get out of the day. As it was, I think we've got a good baseline to figure out what we want to do um, if we are to do it next year. And Michael and Saha were there, so I invite any comments from them as well if I've um, if there's anything you'd like to add. Um, yeah, I mean, I can just say that, uh, I mean, it, the, the, the vibe from the, the community was really positive. Um, there were, um, you sort of mentioned that people weren't super political, but that's, I think that's a pretty common thing everywhere um at some aspect like at anything that isn't specifically a political event um and i'm yeah I, I had lots of really great conversations with the people who were 
um, sort of di had different levels of engagement. And um, there was only like sort of one or two people who came with some level of um, not adversarial uh, sort of questioning, but uh, sort of a little bit of heat. And those were people who were um, volunteers of other political party stalls. So it, I, I, for me, it was a very positive uh, experience and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think uh, we pulled it together really well and um, it was just a good day of people just wanting to enjoy themselves and um, I think, yeah, I think we had fun. Uh, it's interesting to figure out, I guess, different styles. Um, I couldn't stay still in the tent, so I, I wanted to go outside and talk to other people. So I think in future maybe we could have a group of people who <laughs> rove and just inflict fusion on everyone. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Did any, anyone have any questions about that? Oh, I, I guess actually, yeah. So when you mentioned like inflicting fusion on people, um, we had stickers, didn't we? Mm. Yeah, we yeah. can't give those away though. Oh, I want to show you. Oh. Audio's gone. As, as if we weren't allowed to or we... As it was, we weren't oh. able to because people didn't want them such. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, the city of Sydney didn't want people giving away paper flyers, particularly. But I think stickers were okay, given that they were to be taken home and stuck on things. Um, I'll yeah, post we, that. we did have some. We did have some there. They, they weren't like super prominent. As the, there was more the fans that we were. We don't mean sort of giveaway thing, but people, some people, we, some people did take some stickers. Yeah, it was kind of hard to display them without them getting blown away. Whenever there was a very welcome, cool breeze. Um, yeah, so that's another thing we had on display was the stickers. We had an iPad, but it was not bright enough to compete with the sun, and also it shut down in the heat of the day. <laughs> um, so if we're going to have an electronic display again, I'd like to try and find one of those e-paper kind of things like a um like an ebook like the Kindle, yeah yeah um yeah that's um good times all right any questions before we move on to our aston campaign item so it's round about october that we have to um put in our application if we are interested again next year so keep that in mind if you uh think it looks cool and want to see it happen again okay let's move on to astonishing aston so we have our candidate here uh endorsed for the science whoa i'll cut that out of the video <laughs> now owen is a member of the science branch of fusion and endorsed for the fusion party um so uh yes aston by-election is coming up very rapidly and i will or owen will share his screen i believe oh yeah i'll have um if we just stop sharing now i'll bring up some slides in a sec um, yeah, sorry, I didn't add them to the uh, other presentation. But uh, anyway, um, but yeah, I guess, um, uh, thank you um, for clarifying, Andrea. Yeah, I used to be in the Science Party. Um, I believe in, I guess, advancement as one of the main things. Um, and actually on that note, um, you know, coming into this election, it was, you know, what occurred to me first of all was that, you know, this is a great opportunity for Fusion to spread its values. Um, we have solutions that are relevant, you know, 20, 30 years, even longer into the future. And I feel that Liberal and Labor have been um, sort of taking it easy. They're much the same. Um, people know that if they vote for the incumbent parties, not much is going to change. And I guess, you know, some people would say, you know, don't rock the vote. Things are pretty fine how it is. But um, my pitch so far has been that Australia can achieve even more um, Australia has so much potential that's being untapped and even undermined. And I guess why um, initially I was a bit worried, um, you know, should I be the candidate? People might say, you know, he's a New Yorker, he's not a local. Why should we trust him to do the right thing? And I guess this premise is more, um, if you have a candidate who says, you know, I'm a local, I'm a good guy, vote for me, 
it often goes hand in hand with, I don't have any ideas just yet, but trust me, you know, I'll come up with some of them on the fly and it'll be great because I'm a local. Versus, yeah, Fusion's alternative approach, which is actually we already have these ideas. They're very relevant for decades in the future. And, you know, instead of just trusting me to come up with them, I've, we've already come up with them. Here are the ideas. Um, and then I guess as well, there's uh, something which finally tipped me over the line. There's um, this philosophical quote, maybe you guys will agree with it as well. Um, it goes, um, uh, so Jean Gasol, vous savez ce qu'il faut faire. Ne laissez pas tomber votre nation. La disco a besoin de vous. Oh, which translates as um, you were never alone. You know what needs to be done. Don't let your nation fall. Your disco needs you. Um, but I guess, as, you know, if we we're going to say <laughs> Kylie Minogue lyrics as um, a convincing reason to, to run for election or to, uh, to appeal to a particular party, I guess, um, you know, there's also, um, what is it, uh, Better the Devil You Know. So I guess maybe the liberals could cite that as like the relevant song for them. Um, although I guess, you know, there's as well, you know, um, who's the candidate she's married to a, a News Corp journalist. So, um, yeah, the, you know, there's, that a line, there's a line from Illusion. Um, uh, uh, like a magazine, are you what you see? Um, but anyway, um, back to the um, back to the important points. Um, I should clarify that you know when we talk about uh, Aston is a relevant place to to apply Fusion's ideas. You know, it's not so. This is like it's some sort of test tube, some sort of sandbox. Um, Aston has you know already good things going for it. I mean, Fern Free Gully, for instance, it's gorgeous. You know, I certainly don't want to spoil that. I think like there is, as I said, a lot to like about Aston already. It's that Australia can be even better. Um, so I guess comparing the appeal of, um, of Fern Tree Gully, I guess at the opposite end of the spectrum would perhaps be Westfield or Knox. Uh, if you go to, I guess, any Westfield in the world, you'll see this sort of sterile, sterile environment. You know, there's plastic plants everywhere, um, just, you know, the steel and the glass. And where in the world are you? It could be anywhere. Except I guess, you know, uh, you can see the local birds that fly in and get trapped in the skylights. Um, it's disappointing. Uh, but then but they did have an outdoor section as well, uh, ozone, uh, which I guess, you know, I mean, why not just call it carbon monoxide? Um, I guess there's, you know, this sort of um, appeal to scientific misunderstanding. Um, but I guess, you know, there's also this, um, we could draw the metaphor that, you know, you're surrounded in this, uh, environment that you don't realize is bad for you until you know you just run out of energy and drop dead. Um, and we see, you know, in this sense, you know, the, the plastic trees and everything, these environments are creating sort of caricatures of appealing places that we like. We have this innate biological desire um, for these various traits in our environment, in our personal lives. And Westfield does a, a reasonable job of tapping into them. But it's still, it can never quite get there. Um, and so, on this point, I should mention as well, there's this um, interesting idea from Silicon Valley. Um, I was uh, listening to this speech by Peter Thiel. Um, it was called Competition is for Losers. And the premise here is that most markets, it's either very fierce competition or pretty much monopolies. And in the very fierce competition, you know, there's that economic theory that um, as players compete against each other, the price you pay for any goods is pretty much um, like it, it's asymptotically towards just the cost of the raw materials and the cost of production uh, versus, you know, if you have a monopoly, you can charge whatever you want and make serious money. And so in this sense, I, I should mention as well, sorry, um, why not more people realise it, um, or, you know, assuming it's true. Uh, which I believe it is, um, why not more people believe it is because both sides of the equation align. So on the monopoly side, you know, Microsoft or Amazon might say, we're not monopolies, we're heavily competitive against, uh, you know, eBay, Etsy, uh, new players could come along at any time and eat our lunch. Um, but, you know, with Amazon, we see, um, especially when it comes to books, uh, music, you know, they have very... A, a very serious amount of power um, and both sides of the equation get squeezed, the buyers and the sellers. There was a case, for instance, where um, you could sign up to uh, what do you call it, Audible. Um, and 
at the end of listening to the book, customers were offered a deal. Would you like to return this book? You know, no questions asked. They're, they're already at the end of the book. And many people clicking, you know, yes, get the refund. Um, and some of the uh, publishers allegedly thought something was up. You know, I don't know how they would know, like how many listeners they expect. But anyway, um, one day some data got leaked where um, instead of just telling the author, here's how much you're getting from us, it actually revealed, you know, here's how much was in, you know, user sales and here was how much was returned. So therefore, here's what you're getting. And, you know, these were serious numbers of returns. Um, so anyway, you know, the whole thing's busted open. But back to the Westfield example. Oh, sorry. In, in regards to the other side, why the other side lies, um, Peter Till gives this example of a British restaurant in San Jose. Um, and this restaurant says, uh, you know, we're the, we're the only British restaurant in San Jose. This, this is special. But, you know, if you're going out for dinner, you know, I want food, uh, it has to be pretty close. There aren't too many variables in the equation. And so this sense that there's something special about this restaurant, like, ah, there's not, there's not really anything special about it. No. So back to the Westfield example, um, I would make the case that this is basically a localised monopoly. You see, for instance, they put the car parks on the outside, they put the large stores, you know, Target, all that on the outside, and they force people into, like, the inner atrium of, you know, the glass and the steel um, and, you know, the ponds. You know, people throw their money in the pond thinking that their life is going to get a bit better. Um, but uh, I guess it would be much more productive to vote for a political party to make their life better. But anyway, um, so what I'm saying is that there are powerful forces subverting what's good for us. Um, and this brings us to the idea of the paperclip maximizer. Um, for anyone you know, not too familiar with AI, um, there's this notion you have an AI and you give it a task, uh, make as many paperclips as possible. And it quickly realizes that you know, humans, humans have the power to turn off the machine. So that's no good for power. In paperclip production. And then also, you know, humans have some of the raw materials that could go into paperclips. So why not just wipe out the humans and, you know, turn the whole earth, like churn that through the factory of making paperclips? Um, I should, I'll show you actually, um, let's do a Venn diagram. Got the white one. No, where was, yeah, yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah. So if, um, let's see, if I remember correctly, so we have, if we say, you know, this, this one can be um, human needs. Let's make them yellow. And then, hold on. Yeah, so human needs. And then I guess we can say um, what's done by governments. Come to government. It can be government though. Just to say, it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess, um, you know, we can say what's provided by by the market. Uh, let's make that up. Okay. And so, yeah, um, there's what I'm saying is that maybe like self actualization, that's a human need that's not being met by the market or by government. Um, so when we were saying before about like how there are very competitive businesses or monopolies, um, you could have a business that um, I guess is very enjoyable and helps you probably lower in Maslow's hierarchy, but anything to do with like meditation, spirituality, emotional intelligence, um, if they're giving, if it's one-on-one -on -one advice, you know, that's not scalable, that can't create a monopoly. And so if there's not serious money in it, many players are just never going to enter the market. Um, and if we compare that to, um, you know, I guess obviously over here, we we'll just we'll have a chart there. Um, and then what else is there? There would be, um, I guess, you know, things the market provides that we actually need. So, you know, phones, um, we could say as well, stocks. Where would NFTs go? Anyway, um, but then, yeah, so anything which overlaps here, you know, that the um, anything where government could provide it or commerce could provide, that's essentially things that can be sold off, things that can be uh, privatized. So, you know, if we think water, uh, electricity. And then, um, 
I guess here would be so things provided by the government that you know the free market couldn't provide. Uh, we could say like social services, for instance. Um, and then I guess yeah, actually, if you know humans could provide it, um, humans could provide social services as well. I would argue, but um, not all the same ones the government provides. Um, and so I guess here, oh, we left with a, a spare category actually. Things the government spends money on that the market doesn't and that don't actually serve human needs. So I guess there's, you know, kickbacks, what else? I guess busy work. Um, and so I guess um, my main goal, uh, my main pitch is that there is some of, some of this yellow area, um, you know, maybe the government could grow it slightly, maybe, um, Oh, not, not so much the market since they wouldn't be charging for it. So you basically, um, hold on, I'll stop sharing. What's the, yeah. Um, so basically, if, um, if humans could more easily form communities providing each other services, then that's something that can fill up more of the circle of human needs that need to be addressed. And so um, if, if we consider for, you know, a tangible example, let's consider open source version of LinkedIn. Uh, so you go to LinkedIn at the moment and, you know, we could argue that that's clearly a monopoly. I mean, where do you go to look for a job or anything? Maybe, I don't know, seek.com.au, um, but that's only Australia. Anyway, but um, it will be apparent to many people visiting Seek, you know, when, uh, sorry, LinkedIn, where do they make their money? It's mainly from recruiters. Recruiters pay to message people. Um, they pay to post jobs. Um, so if LinkedIn wants to make money, they need to maximize how often people interact with recruiters. So you'll see various articles being promoted by LinkedIn. It says, um, you know, have you tried the four day work week? Um, they talk about quiet quitting. And basically all this shit that is going to get you fired, that is what LinkedIn promotes. Um, so if you don't want to lose your job, basically stay away from LinkedIn. Um, and imagine if there was an open source alternative to it, we can imagine if you're about to enter university, for instance, what is the point? Um, if I study art history, how many people are currently in the workforce with a job art historian, for instance, or even just, you know, people who studied art history, do they have a job at all? This would be very useful data to see. And, you know, once after I graduated, actually, I remember my university asking me, um, you know, do you feel your engineering degree is relevant? Uh, what's your job title now? Um, I don't recall seeing this data presented before I started university, but even then, you know, it, it's in their interest to say like, oh yeah, everybody who studies engineering at University of Sydney, you know, gets a job as an engineer. Like, why, why would they tell me like, oh no, just like, watch out, Owen, you might not get a job. Like, they, they want to, you know, they want to sell me on the course. And so here in this open source model, people could see the recommendation algorithms and they could see that what is being recommended to someone is because it is a genuine fit for their personality, um, their skills. And they can see as well that they're going to get true insights into which industries might have a future for them. So yeah, something real world. Anyway, back to the, uh, the current workplace. We see, unfortunately, that many jobs have been created less to meet self-actualization and merely or to fill in for robots who can't quite do it all. Uh, you'll see people have jobs essentially like twerking in front of the camera to create content that can then be recommended by the TikTok algorithm, for instance. Or maybe these people are grabbing items from the largely robotic factory. Um, but hey, you know, in this robotic warehouse, um, they're giving script the chambers um, to, I guess, make up for the fact that, you know, they have time to 12 breaks as well, amongst other things. But anyway, um, I would say, even if you have fulfilling work, even if you aren't in one of these roles, you'll be surrounded by people who don't. And, you know, what happens to these people? They might turn to crime, they might turn to terrorism. I mean, go to any Q&A event in Melbourne and you'll inevitably hear someone screaming, why haven't we fucking burned down capitalism yet? And, you know, is this gonna get more frequent? Um, I mean, my guess is uh, most likely, especially as AI is put in the hands of companies who 
as we discussed before, you know, companies have their own needs to serve. They don't have our needs to serve. And so when people talk about how worrying it is that maybe AIs will go rogue and kill us all, I would say, who's controlling the AIs? If it's companies like TikTok, uh, for instance, you know, the recommendation algorithm started off as great. It recommended lots of content that people wanted to watch. But, you know, ultimately, TikTok's goal is to distract you for as long as possible in the day. Keep you watching TikTok, keep you watching their ads. And so we can imagine sort of brain dead zombies stuck all day in the Instagram feed, in the TikTok feed, instead of using AI's power for good. Anyway, um, so as well, in terms of, um, sorry, I lost my spot. Oh, sorry, yeah, what I was saying about, um, so the mental health pressures of AI is getting out of control. Um, there's, besides mental health pressure from that, there's also the mental health stress from the housing crisis, uh, which, you know, is yet to be addressed. Um, and to put it in some perspective, from 2015 till 2022, so seven years, uh, house prices in Australia rose by 40%. Um, and so the terms here around the housing affordability crisis, people mention uh, negative gearing, for instance. So that's the notion of um, the amount I'm paying for the mortgage is more than what I'm actually getting in rent. Um, so, you know, I'm losing money essentially, but you know, why would anyone do that? Um, it's because they're betting that the whole value of the house is going to go up and that's going to make up for this shortfall of rent. Um, you know, it's, it's, is it an investment or is it just a bet? Um, and the fusions policy is basically if houses are treated like investments, then they will, you know, become investments as opposed to places to live and, you know, who suffers, you know? The people who wanted places to live. Um, and so, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll bring up the graph. Uh, where's the. Yeah, so here we go. So here um, we can see the house prices in a few Western countries. Um, so, yeah, as I said, 40% for Australia and red. And in black, the most insane one is New Zealand. So house prices in New Zealand from 2015 to 2022 went up about, uh, they doubled in that time. And so um, if we think, sorry, I'm just, let's distract <laughs> So yeah, if we think about, um, you know, houses as investments, um, you know, they rise in value, uh, you get a pay day, um, and then it turns out in Australia, you get a discount on that pay day. What did you do to earn it though? You know, you didn't make the community a better place to live. You didn't make the housing any more appealing. Even foreigners, you know, foreigners can buy houses in Australia. The house price rises in value. What did they do? They're in a faraway land. They didn't do anything to, to make this house more valuable. And it should be mentioned actually that, um, so Adam Noman, who used to be, um, you know, he, uh, WeWork, he was the founder of WeWork. Um, he's now involved in a company called Flow. Um, and, you know, it's still in stealth. He was talking about it briefly in the podcast. But the notion is, um, if I make a neighbourhood a more appealing place to live, then, you know, people around me are going to want to stay more. And then the house price is going to rise. And basically, I should get a cut of that somehow, that increase in value that I brought on. And we can see, uh, you know, a corollary of that is that if I was a really negative person who is a bad influence on the neighbourhood, you know, people would be moving out, the neighbourhood would be lowering in value, and I would think, oh, shit, this is bad, for, you know, for my income as well. Like, I'm not going to have these savings if I keep ruining this neighbourhood. I better sell out. But then would they sell out? Because they might be making a loss on their investment. And when, um, when I was dealing blackjack at the casino, I saw that, you know, the house advantage of 2%, wasn't really necessary. It's just human nature alone. People can't quit while they're ahead. And if they start losing, they will absolutely chase their losses. They're terrified of losing. And so we see in the housing market, when it's treated that this should be an investment and you see people, instead of collecting baseball cards and NFTs, they're collecting houses and they refuse to sell at a loss. And so what we get is a market that behaves the same as if they were just colluding in prices. They don't actually need to tell each other. And as well, when these collections build up between the haves and the have-nots, it's 
effectively a feudal society being created in Australia between the landlords and the serfs. So Fusion's policy here is the most obvious change. I mentioned that as a, if the house price goes up in value, there's a capital gains tax applied. At the moment, if you have lived in the house for 12 months or just pretended to live in the house for 12 months, then you get a discount on that capital gains tax. We're saying that that should be removed. So effectively increasing the amount of tax applied there. Um, we could, if we think about the alternatives, you know, that helps to explain what happened in New Zealand. They, um, they had very light, if any, I think capital gains tax um, on houses. So, you know, all these um, mental effects that playing out in the investors' minds, you know, that was pushed to the extreme. And so if everybody thinks like, why not buy a house? It's an easy way to make money. Prices always go up because, you know, I'm going to refuse to sell at a loss and they're going to refuse to sell at a loss. So obviously price is going to go up. Um, but as a way of trying to stop that, uh, New Zealand had the notion of, um, what do they call it? The bright line test. If you sell a house within two years, there's this bright line that you're obviously just doing it for investment purposes. But hey, you know, if I'm going to make a lot of money, I can, I'm willing to wait more than two years, but it's fine. Um, another, a more extreme tax example we might like to consider is the Harburger tax. Um, a variation was tried in Copenhagen centuries ago. I'm not quite sure if it is still there, sorry. But um, so for ships going through the port, the, sorry for the, I'm not sure of these maritime terms, but the, the ship was coming into Copenhagen and they had to pay a customs tax based on the value of the ship. And, you know, they don't have time to assess everything that's in the ship. So the ship would declare itself, my goods are worth, you know, 30 buckets of gold. And therefore, if I apply, you know, 10% tax rate, I will give you Copenhagen and three buckets of gold to, to come to your port. Um, and, you know, obviously they could lie. And so the catch was, if you said my ship is worth 30 barrels of gold, maybe the Copenhagen government says, okay, we will buy your ship then for 30 barrels of gold. That's what you said it's worth. And so um, if we were, were to apply the same idea to housing, um, then we can see number one, um, oh, so, so it, let's say it was like a yearly tax. My house is worth a million dollars. So every year I'll pay, you know, 10K, whatever. Uh, we can see that one effect it would have is that people would move houses very quickly. Um, like, why am I wasting money on this in this place I don't need to be? Um, and then as well, it would be land gets put to its most productive use. I mean, can you imagine the neighborhood sprawl scenario, for instance, where maybe there are no cafes around, someone realizes like, hey, these people probably want, you know, a meeting place, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll buy the house on the corner and I'll turn it into a cafe and then it'll create a sense of community. Um, so we can see how the, all these ideas can fit together and how there are, there's real solutions to these problems that might have seemed insurmountable before if you just rely on the local good bloke to, uh, to come up with ideas on the fly. Oh, sorry for digging it there, Megan. Um, anyway, uh, getting back to, oh yeah, so when I mentioned urban sprawl, uh, I guess um, that is probably the easiest way out of the housing affordability crisis. Instead of doing anything about the existing, uh, the housing density, any of those problems, hey, let's just build some new houses over there. And why, why do cities spring up? You know, maybe there's a convenient river, maybe there's a mine, maybe there's some good farmland. But, you know, if you just look at Aston from above, you'll see some pockets that clearly just sprung up as urban sprawl. I'll show you, um, to prove my point, I can't just make this up, here, this place. Okay, we want, this is in one turner, so no, I can't. Okay, anyway, you, you can see it. So clearly, um, you know, why is it here? There's nothing here, it's got grid, like, this is clearly just, hey, here's a, here's a patch of land. We can build some houses here. Oh, they do have a cafe on the corner. That's, that's right. Maybe that's a nice place to live after all. Sorry, I shouldn't, shouldn't be so big about urban sport. Um, anyway, back to the point. Um, you see as well that um, in when the urban sprawl pops up, you know, it's not well served by public transport or anything like that. It's very car dependent. Um, and, you know, if you were to walk around the neighborhood, for instance, in this car dependent neighborhood, you know, are you going to bump into someone nice and, you know, spring up a new friendship? Or are your neighbours in the distance going to call up? Who's this strange person? They'll report you to Crime Stoppers. 
um, we see as well that the lack of public transport means, you know, it's um, very big roads, you know, like three lanes each way, cars going very fast, cycling isn't really practical in that environment. Um, walking is not very enjoyable, all the businesses on the sides of the road, you know, everything's far apart, so they need their own parking lot, which, you know, makes the problem even worse. Um, yesterday, when I happened to be, um, yeah, yesterday when I was visiting Knox, the Westfield there, um, I happened to see this, unfortunately, there was this uh, coffee shop closed down on the corner, the drive through coffee shop, because, you know, it's a great place. Um, and I thought, you know, this looks exactly like the strobes talked about on not just bikes um, across between a street and a road. Uh, and so I looked at Google Maps where I was. It was literally called High Street Road, <laughs> like a real strobe live in the flesh. You, you can't make this up. And, it, you know, it, it's not good. It's not an enjoyable place to live. The maintenance costs on all the roads are insane. And it's not um, when we talked before about the Westfield ozone section of like outdoors, pretending to be this nice European city, everything's walkable, there's music playing. That's the sort of thing that people legitimately enjoy. People don't like hanging out at the drive through coffee shop, unfortunately. But anyway, um, in, I guess the final point about the, the urban sprawl is that, um, as I said, Australians don't really like living in isolation, shielded from each other by these colour bond fences and the driving cages. I think Australians enjoy a, a sense of togetherness, a sense of community. We look out for each other and we support a fair go for all. Australians can pull together in a crisis. It's not just the housing crisis, but the current climate crisis too. I think that most people acknowledge that something needs to be done and they know what's right. And they're worried about the economic consequences of suddenly making a switch. Some people are stepping up and installing their own solar panels. But this is DC power and it's not dispatchable. So some of the ideas for the transition involve community batteries and perhaps community inverters, because this is a non-negligible cost in the system. Another of Fusion's policies is to support more of a carbon tax as opposed to carbon credits. We need to actually get to zero, not just net zero. We can't say job done because of accounting trickery. Uh, we also support measures for the government to commission new power plants rather than just leaving it to the whims of the market. Um, yes, these plants will be competing with incumbent coal plants. And so, you know, isn't it a shame that they won't be making quite as much money anymore? Um, you know, people who don't enjoy the notion of shutting down coal plants will say, what about the jobs? We've got to protect jobs. Workers, unfortunately, are locked into a system where they're economically dependent on these jobs, which could be immoral or irrelevant but the workers need to keep doing them anyway to put bread on the table. And so that, uh, that brings us to the notion of universal basic income, people having a living wage and, you know, not having to be wage slaves to immoral companies in the meantime. Universal basic income would allow people the freedom to set their own course in life, to discover their natural talents and to pursue work that they find to be meaningful with the adoption of such a liberating economic foundation, we may actually see the energy transition, uh, we might see sorry, the energy transition happening faster than we had predicted. Maybe instead of the coal plant lasting until its 10 year decommissioning, maybe all the workers quit within one year saying, you know what, I would rather get UBI, do something meaningful, stop doing something immoral and hurry the energy transition to renewables. During COVID, we saw that Australia can respond rapidly to changes to our society, and we may see this happening in the energy transition. When Liberal and Labor say the energy transition is too hard, when they fail to run at half the rate they promised, when they say we need to protect jobs, the Fusion Party says that the energy transition isn't too hard and we can decouple someone's self-actualization from their servitude with GDP maximization. We have an educated population. We have world-class universities and schools, and we have cities rated in the top 10 places to live. We have all the ingredients to host the next Silicon Valley, the next oasis of innovation that shapes the rest of the world. Australians know we have the potential to do more. They know that Liberal and Labor are only interested in preserving their spot. I'm proud to be leading the charge for Fusion at this election, offering Australians a chance to break free from the misaligned incentives holding them back 
and to live a fuller life that they know is possible. Voting fusion means being part of the solution. Voting fusion means believing that Australia is capable of something truly remarkable. I thank you for your support in this mission. Wow, thanks, thank Owen. <laughs> thanks, Alex. Would you be able to share a transcript of that or um, would we'll you do, be making yes. more videos of that? Yeah. Uh, I messed up some of the lines, so maybe I need to re-record some of these. <laughs> Thanks, Owen, for sharing your vision uh, with us. Um, what have I written down here? I love the framing of land tax as calling people's bluff, the same mm. way with ships in the harbour. So, okay, you reckon you've got a $2 million property? Cool. Uh, pay 0.1% land tax on that. Go ahead. Mm. And I don't yeah. think it's... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, actually, yeah, I was thinking, um, so my apartment in... Um, my last apartment in New York, I remember um, something, how did I see it? I think they posted on a website or something. They said that um, my landlord should be paying um, his property valuation for this apartment was like 500K, I think it was. Um, and I saw that and I thought, what 500K? Why am I renting? Why don't I just buy this place? Um, and then, you know, I went to the real estate site and I saw like, oh no, you know, like the similar properties were basically, you know, like one and a half million. And I thought, but wait, hang on, we're like, why, why, did, why did the government say 500K? It turns out um, there's this sort of averaging going on in New York. Like, you know, this building has, you know, 40 apartments um, and, you know, out of New York buildings with 40 apartments, each apartment is typically worth, you know, let's say 500K. Um, and if it turns out that the assessment is wrong, only the owner can apply to get it readjusted. Like, why, why would you do that? Oh, no, my, you know, I should pay so much more tax. My property is so much more valuable. And, you know, where it gets the most extreme, uh, billionaires row, you know, close to Central Park. But, you know, I guess the name says it all. Um, but, you know, they get assessed on the same averages as, you know, places in the Bronx, which, um, I, like, uh, what's the Sydney context? I guess, like, the, uh, the wealth disparity in Sydney is thankfully a lot more um, a lot nicer than like the wealth extremes in America. <laughs> I've heard the comment that um, America is the richest poor country in the world. <laughs> um, anyway, could be that in Australia. <laughs> I don't think any of that is to particularly demonise landlords. I think um, mm -hmm. yeah. when we've, uh, those of us who, you know, moved out of home, I think we appreciated having a rental market, which is now really constricting. So there's nothing wrong with having landlords to whom you pay rent. But, you know, bringing down the price of housing, I think that's uh, the best thing we can do for our landlords. Oh, right? at, at least stopping the increase. I mean, we saw the graph. The graph's insane. Yeah, just seven years and the price doubled. If I was a landlord, I'd rather be paying uh, much less on my mortgage repayments. So then I could... Uh, not need to charge so much rent to make back my investment mm. i don't know who knows if i'm thinking like a landlord <laughs> uh, love the comment on strodes as well uh walkability is um I, I think it's a huge issue that affects uh you know our daily lives and our mental mm. health uh, and ubi to protect people rather than protecting any particular jobs like coal mining which we know have to change and we have to move to other industries mm -hmm. yeah does, um, oh, does anyone have any questions oh it's not me anyway, let's uh oh, let's move on oh did, did we have anything else well no i'm just looking forward to seeing more from your campaign um so I'm looking forward to whatever that comes out so yay thanks yeah. so much all right, keep an eye on the socials and always please do like, share and comment anywhere that you see them. Oh, sorry, um, Simon, did you want to say something? Oh, Simon. Do you have any uh, comments to say that could be positive towards uh, landlords who may be in the best <laughs> scenario? <laughs> um. I, I would say, yeah, um, so, our, so Fusion's vision, it, it's not an anti-landlord agenda. It, our agenda is to increase the potential of Aston. And so when I mentioned, for instance, um, Aston, how Aston has the potential to be the next Silicon Valley, um, I gave this example because, um, you know, when, oh, what's it called? When Shockley Semiconductor set up in Silicon Valley, 
you know, that's what, that's what started it. That's why it's called that. Um, and, you know, Shockley was choosing a place where he just wanted to live. And that was also close to universities. Um, and, you know, California back then, Mountain View specifically, was, you know, I guess the name Mountain View, you know, it's, a, it's got a gorgeous view. Um, it's right in, you know, San Francisco Bay. It, it, it was a nice place back then. And I, when I was in Fern Tree Gully recently, it seems, you know, Fern Tree Gully is gorgeous. There are the universities all around Melbourne. As I said before, Melbourne is regularly rated in the top 10 cities to live. And I'm saying these are exactly the same ingredients that why Shockley Semiconductor set up. Um, but I would argue that we have it even better. And, you know, you see that the education market in Australia is one of our biggest exporters. But, you know, foreign students come in, they study, they go back to wherever it was they grew up in. Um, instead of leaving, um, and instead as well, like Australians, especially when they study engineering, uh, you know, STEM, often they'll move to the United States, for instance. I met quite a few Americans, uh, sorry, a few Australians in America who had studied, um, you know, science or engineering and had moved to America to work versus I never saw the opposite. Um, and so, you know, our skills, I feel, are going to waste. And I think if we made more, if we better captured the economic opportunities available to us as Australians, then I think most Australian cities, if not all of them, stand to benefit. And so in that sense, um, the Aston landlords can look forward to more people who want to live in the area. There's no greater frustration than feeling underutilized. So mm. yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. So what should people do if uh, they want to help out with your campaign, Owen? Oh, one of the best ways to help would be um, if you're able to come to one of the polling places and give out, you know, the how to vote cards. Um, yeah, that would, that would be fantastic. There are going to be 32 of those locations. Um, I should mention that, um, yeah, the, I, I had been fearful of doing it before. I thought everyone would say, like, I don't like the fusion party, go away for um, some, you know, variation from those words that might not be as politically correct. But um, no, there were, I don't recall anybody saying nasty things to me. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it's really not as much pressure as you might think it is. Um, yeah. And I guess, do you want to be part of the solution or part of the problem? Mm. <laughs> I want to come down on the weekends and I'll help you. I, I love you. Yeah, have yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right, let's see if we can get some links in the chat. And um, were there any other questions for Owen? We just uh, have one last thing to wrap up on otherwise. Great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, I'll uh, click back to. Oh, dear. Where do you reckon I've put my slides? I think I might have closed them. <laughs> oh no. Uh, let's do this. Oh. And then where does my Zoom window go when I open the slides back up? That's another mystery for the ages. Uh, cool. All right. Gone back to slide one, but that's all right. Here we go. Do you uh, have a theme that you're wearing when you're campaigning? Oh, yeah, you saw um, I have the I have a, like floral shirt and I was going to wear the, the white suit. Um, cool. <laughs> it looks like <laughs> I'm in Miami, but uh, I saw it. <laughs> nice. Oh, screen sharing's paused. Well, let's resume. Okay. <laughs> Why won't it work? Is it because it's sharing Owens? It said double oh, click to enter full screen mode, but it was black. Should do it. Screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Stop share. Oh, I'm sorry, Saha. So sick of Zoom. <laughs> Where are the... I think we should move to Discord, to be honest. <laughs> I hate Zoom. Mm. Zoom stresses me out. <laughs> it's uh, it's like it's powerful, but uh, finicky. Hmm. 
I don't know. I wouldn't even know how to suggest what to do. Discord. Switch hmm. to Discord. Uh, Andrea, can we do it without the screen sharing? Let's just continue the question. I'm sure there's a way, there's an alternate way. What would that be though? Is there anyone else you can share? It's giving me the option to, I'm just going to share and see if it kicks you off and then you can jump back on. I don't have the slides open. Yeah. So that says, says it's loading. I'm now sharing. I'm now going to stop. Do you reckon that's fixed for us, Michael? Yeah. Nah, your screen sharing is paused. I took myself off screen sharing and now it won't let me back on. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. sorry. No, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, don't worry. Let's go. Which slide did you want, Andrew? Oh, the last slide. Oh, I see. Oh, the maze. Yeah, yeah. So how do you want to take it away? Oh, yeah, okay. Sure. So um, we've been working hard behind the scenes, bringing together five parties and what we've done alongside consolidating our major core policies is looking deeper into what we value. So I threw this um, image out into the public and stuck a um, framework survey just to gather people's opinions on this. We got about 50 people responding, which was, you know, ample enough data to deal with on what people think about this, just on a first impression. Um, some of it was just people didn't know and people didn't have much of an interpretation of it, but some people really got it. And um, I thought that was very heartening. So I'll just say briefly though, the reason why we have it in these circles like this is it's about, not about hierarchy so much, but about the natural priorities that come up when we make, when we do decision making based on our values. So individual freedom being at the bottom, that's pretty much our most primitive primary core value. So ideally, if we're in an absolutely everything is free and, and we can do whatever we want sort of utopia, everyone would have freedom. That would be awesome. But then we start to think about, okay, well, what else do we want in this world? Um, so we think about advancement. And so advancement's next. And we're saying advancement is super important as well. Um, and we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of our individual freedom to allow more widely accessible advancement for a wider demographic. Same thing with deep ecology. So that's concerned with um, nurturing the environment and recognizing that us as humans, as animals, are also intrinsically part of the environment. And, and because of that deep connection between us and our surroundings, we need to nurture both. So um, we love advancement, but not at the expense of deep ecology. And then same thing going up the chain, you know, safety, but not at the expense of ethical conduct, because we want ethical conduct across everything and in, in, in every way. And then equity is the universal value. So all of these things that we value within it, within these circles, we want them to be available to as many people as possible. And that's that as just a little taste, but um, we'll be having some more presentations and I really want um, just something quick and easy for the public to really just grasp and understand it and aiming to have this alongside the Aston campaign. Um, and that's that. Any questions on that? I'm hurting you. What do you mean? Sorry, was I too loud? No, you put you, you said, oh, not that many people care about the indiv individual freedom that much. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, that's most oh, important that? to me. Oh, no, no, no. I was saying individual freedom is our core value. Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe I misspoke. I feel, I feel like all of it is like equally as important as, as each other. And it, it all, it all depends on, on the lens of the viewer of what's most important to them personally. But yeah. as, as a group, I think we need to give it a bit more fairness to all the <laughs> values. I think I get what you're saying, but it's more like a misinterpretation. So I think I, I probably expressed that incorrectly, but um 
I'm curious to hear what you mean by that so that we can clarify it better. Any questions, Andrea? Yeah, oh, I think it's just the way that we talk about it. And this is what we're figuring out um, how best to explain it now, right? So um, I think it's maybe fair to say that um, relatively few people want absolute individual freedom. I think a lot of us want responsibilities that go along with that individual freedom. So um, freedom to do what we want until it starts to impinge on someone else's freedoms. Um, so maybe that's that's one way of framing it. If that's what we settle on, that absolute individual freedom um, mm. is it's not, uh, I don't know, it's not practical. It's not realistic. Well, let, let's go with a, a scenario. So if we had full on individual freedom, that's going to potentially impact on advancement because maybe someone goes, oh, I don't believe in science. I want a life without science. I'm going to go prim. But that's going to limit advancement for the majority of others. Or we don't want advancement at the expense of ruining the environment, which is kind of where we're at now with coal. We're just like, let's keep pumping the coal. Um, well, good luck, not, environment. Good luck, not, safety. That's not, a, that's not an individual freedom issue at all. I don't think people have their own personal coal reactors in their backyard and say it's my right oh. to, 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 to do this. But um, just, just generally speaking, like I don't think uh, fusion is a party of extremes. We're not, we're not an extremist party. So I, I wouldn't have interpreted any of these to be on the extreme end either. So I don't think anyone would even suggest that individual freedom would go past the point of infringing on other people's freedoms um and and you know same same with any other of these topics in there I mean, there's other people in the party who are you know very deep on the ecology side of things as possibly their one and only um thing so you know to be to be placed somewhere in the middle um might not might not line up very well in, in their eyes and uh and, and maybe to an extent you know there, there could be some people in the party who do have some extreme views on some of these but I don't think that's the norm and what it's being referred to here as in an extreme yeah. sense yeah does anyone else have um uh, I guess, something yeah, to add yeah so Simon when we say um you know we're not considering the extremes I guess um well considering the edge cases is the way that I guess logically we could have this sort of hierarchy going on um and also in, in regards to the um the notion of individual freedom, but still something, some sort of counter force. Um, I would say like the Statue of Liberty, for instance, you know, she's free, she's been liberated, and yet she still is holding the book of laws for how society needs to be run. There's this notion that um, liberty doesn't mean sort of the wild west of uh, libertarians, I guess. But also another relatable example, if we consider, for instance, like people in wheelchairs, so we should say individual freedom. I'm allowed to create my business however the hell I feel like it. If I want the grand staircase at the front, then like, oh, well, people with wheelchairs come, can't come in, but it's my staircase. I'll do as I want. Um, and, you know, advancement argument. I mean, some people might say like eugenics, for instance, like who cares if someone can't with wheelchair can't come in. And then I guess, you know, ethical conduct, equity. It's like this person is a human being just because they're in a wheelchair. Like, so what? They're still a human being. Like, why did you build this grand staircase here? Uh, if you're going to build buildings in our society, then we would like all members of our society to be able to enter the building. Um, we could extend it to, to ducks as well, um, but I guess that's that's not a fusion policy. But it's my own ideas. To ducks? Ducks. Ducks are cute. People say they like ducks. They're on the, you know, dawn detergent. Even hunting magazines, they put ducks on the front. I mean, the people are shooting the ducks. It's still like seeing them. Mm. And yet um, you see regularly videos of like, you know, ducks crossing a strode and, you know, someone stopping and helping the duck. And it's like, oh, isn't this nice? But <laughs> the problem's still there. The same thing is going to happen tomorrow. And then you mm -hmm. see as well, like, you know, the, the chain link fence. And like, there's a little, what do you call it? The small swan, the egret, I think it is, is trying to get through the fence to the, the river and they're stuck. And like someone was helping out. And, you know, again, isn't this human nice? Helping the egret get to the, the river. But like, why have we put up these fences everywhere? that are duck proof like why are the fences there anyway i mean yeah like to note that there's a property line and maybe stop humans coming in but why is it duck proof as well 
um, you know, same as the colour bottom fence. It's like, what if we lived in a community surrounded by environment, surrounded by animals, uh, surrounded by nature? It, for many people, their notion of paradise is being surrounded by this sort of lovable scenario where the animals like them and they enjoy nature. Um, and we're needlessly stopping that from happening. Hmm. Interesting, Owen. I, uh, I don't know if I got all of that. But I wanted to just say, though, I think maybe calling it a hierarchy isn't the best way. It's more priorities. No, 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 I won't even say priorities. I think what I mean is individual freedom is the most idealistic one. And as we keep going up and up the ladder, it becomes the most practical, practically implemented value. So individual freedom is just like absolutely amazing. We'd love that just unlimited advancement would be awesome but um ethical conduct and equity is where we start to be like well these are the um structures that we value to allow everyone to have access to all these primary values mm -hmm. that's how i see it but it, this is a funny thing because we've been grappling with how to express this we really like these values um but it's the challenge of knowing how to express it. And I think this kind of conversation and this kind of feedback really helps um, helps us articulate it better. And thank you, Ling. I know uh, I gave you the big response spreadsheet to sift through as well. So I guess the main thing is stay tuned and please ask more questions as well so we can just better refine this. Perhaps, perhaps a sort of a question is, uh, what does everyone think of this particular image? Perhaps a, a better question would be, uh, do you have a better su suggestion on how these values could be presented in a easy to read chart? And I would love that. Yeah. Get get some ideas on how we can better do this. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send you something as well. I think it's very awesome. Yeah, it's a it's a real challenge to present something when you've got six different values presenting them in a way that doesn't inaccurately represent them in a hierarchy because visually when you when you're presenting them visually they have to go somewhere on the page so that's going to be the challenge it could be a venn diagram <laughs> maybe like it could a, be like steps like a staircase if it was just a list like it's oh yeah, good like on our about page we have it like a, a grid of uh, two vertical three horizontal that seems fine hmm. yeah so i mean it's going to be an ongoing conversation but um oh, this as well seems fine by the way i think i like the colors <laughs> thanks i copied the colors from the branding um okay. we did have some feedback from the colors someone was raging about the different contrasting of them and and that's why the the white and the black oh, i didn't notice yeah i'm like i don't know <laughs> Not a designer. Anyway, this is good. Yeah. Uh, good. Yes. Yeah. And so the full intention of that, um, just to, to share the values, is I think fusion, we're over a year now. We've grown up, we have a bit of an identity, and it's time to share it and make Australia feel comfortable and learn more about what we offer. Hmm. That's good, yeah. Um, Andrew, any last words? Should we wrap it up? Ah, uh, no, just that um, if you could go on to the second last slide. Hang on, should I do that? Oh, I see. Oh, I, I'll do it, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Of just our events coming up. Um. Yeah, so this Sunday is Clean Up Australia Day. So there's events going on all around Australia. Get out there in your Fusion T-shirt and have a talk about why it's important to you to clean up Australia. Um, and then obviously the Aston by-election coming up in just four weeks. So, yeah, pretty pretty intense campaign mode right now. Um, please do jump onto Discord or send an email if you're interested in helping out. Um, it's really important to have those boots on the ground, those volunteers handing out on election day. And also in the week and a half before that early voting, 
um, because the number of people who vote early has just been increasing uh, with every election since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, something like half of all voters, I think, we can expect to vote before the day. It's a bit... Uh, it's difficult because this, you still get the most bang for buck on election day because there's still half the people there, but you've got time to have a lot of good conversations with people in the lead up when it's a little less hectic. Um, but election day itself is always a, a fun day as well. There's a lot of camaraderie um, between what you might think of as quite disparate um, candidates and parties. And we will be back here uh, on the first Wednesday of next month. And then we'll be also advertising a talk. Now, this is a tentative date, so um, d do put it in your diaries. But uh, we haven't got any. This is the first time we're um, speaking about this, a talk about the Australian public. So much more details to come um, tentatively on Monday the 17th. I think that's about it. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. I've got another meeting to get to. So, thanks. Oh.